It's Palm Sunday morning. Are you waving your palm branches? We welcome you to First Church of God, where we're going to worship God today on this special day in the life of Christ and in the life of our salvation. Matthew writes about this day, and he says, As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her only colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who can't comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna on high. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, and they were asking, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And so this was the beginning of Jesus' last week on earth, a parade leading up to Easter. You know, people, people were celebrating Jesus. But are they celebrating who Jesus is or celebrating who they want him to be? In just a few days, instead of shouting their hosannas, they're going to be screaming, crucify him. Wave the branches, but who are you waving for? The people were singing Jesus' praises, but they didn't even know who he was. They're all stirred up about him, and yet they're asking, who is this? The world still doesn't get who Jesus is. This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth and Galilee, some were saying. Or others, you know, he's that, he's that guru from down in Nazareth. Or the word on the street was, maybe he's Elijah or John the Baptist or some other prophet. He's a great teacher. Some even probably thought he was the Messiah, but they'd be scratching their heads at the end of the week when he ended up on the cross, because that wasn't what they expected. The most religious among them thought he was just plain crazy, a man to be dealt with. And about that, they were right. Jesus is a man to be dealt with, or a man who will deal with you. Others might think he was the Prince of Peace, riding in on a colt. And Jesus is coming, and he does come to bring peace into our lives. And that's true. Nobody will bring peace into your soul like Jesus. He is a peace the world cannot understand. He is a peace that overcomes any troubles that you have. He is a peace that fills your heart and lasts forever. Or here comes the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And on the cross, Jesus took away every sin of mine and yours and the entire world. All the sin that has been and ever will be. God sacrificed his son, the one he loved, for everybody else that he loves. That includes you and me. Our sins have nailed him to the cross. And they've been nailed to the cross and are no more. God sent a savior so that you and I would no longer have to live under sin. Who is this? Well, scripture answers that for us from Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus comes to be king over your life, to be ruler in your heart, to be your Lord. You know, everybody is controlled by something. Everybody is ruled by something or someone. Jesus came to love you. Jesus came to save you. Jesus came to take charge of your life. Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on the cold of a donkey. And they said, the master has need of him. Jesus has need of you. Are you carrying around Jesus in your life 
as your Lord, then you have salvation. You have peace. You have real freedom. Your life is in control no matter what happens. You have reason to celebrate because Jesus has you. Jesus, we thank you for coming to claim us for yourselves. We are yours. We belong to you. You gave everything because you love us with an everlasting love, a love so great that we cannot fathom it, with a sacrifice that cost you every drop of blood, because that's how much we are worth to you. We are grateful for your amazing grace. How I pray that every person who joins with us today will realize how much you love them, that you gave your very self for them, and that they can choose to receive everything that you came to give because of your death and resurrection. We acknowledge you today as king over our lives, the ruler of our hearts, the master of our destiny. You are in control of us and are in control of all our days. You are aware of the pressures each of us face, the new realities of our lives, the dangers of the coronavirus that has upended the life we were used to and is affecting us in so many ways. We put our trust in you. We believe that the effects of the virus are not greater than your ability to work in our lives, no matter how it's impacted us. Bring life where death threatens, health where disease invades, hope where despair lurks, peace where anxiety burdens, daily bread for today's needs. As we worship you today, save us from shallow praise. Save us from ungrateful hearts. Save us from superficial lives. Save us from pleasing the crowd. Save us from fickle faith. Save us from our own prideful parades. Save us from ourselves. Save us for yourself. Wave the testimony of your presence in our life in front of an anxious world that needs to know, no matter how bad it gets, there is a Savior. We thank you. We celebrate you. We honor you today. For it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Just a couple things I want to mention to you today. One is we've been trying to do a few things with uh, music as a part of our worship, and so we're going to try something new. If you have gone to the link in your email, if you're getting this by email, you will notice that there are two tracks of, of uh, worship music that you can follow as a part of this experience. There's a, a traditional track and a contemporary track, so you can either pause this video partway through, or even before you get far into the video, you could click on those links and enjoy some worship music and participate that way while continuing in the service. And the other thing I want to bring to your attention is, since next week is Easter Sunday, we are going to celebrate communion together. Now, of course, we're not going to be in the same location, but I would invite you to find something in your home that you can use for uh, the, the juice and something for the bread. You know, you can decide whatever that's going to be. God will understand that that's what those elements represent. And then next week, we're going to participate together in a time of communion. So have those things ready with you next week as we uh, celebrate Easter together.
Mark's Gospel, he's writing to people who are in Rome. And this is what he says in Mark chapter 4, beginning at verse 35. He says, That evening Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross over to the east side. So they left the crowd, and the disciples started across the lake with him in the boat. Some other boats followed along, and suddenly a windstorm struck the lake. Waves started splashing into the boat, and it was about to sink. Jesus was in the back of the boat with his head on a pillow, and he was asleep. His disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you know that we are about to drown? Jesus got up and ordered the wind and the waves to be quiet. The wind stopped and everything was calm. Jesus asked his disciples, Why were you afraid? Don't you have any faith? Now they were more afraid than ever and said to each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And so Mark is writing to some believers who, who are facing a really difficult time, a stormy time, we might say. The church in Rome is being pressured day in and day out. Jesus has preached the message of God's kingdom. That's why he came. And you know, God's kingdom is not a passive thing. God is always on the move, upsetting the status quo, redefining how we see reality, taking his followers in a direction that it can increase his rule over people's lives and shake up the community for him. And so in part that might explain what we're experiencing in these days. At this particular point, Jesus is about ready to go into a new territory, a new frontier. He's taking his disciples across the lake to a region that's very unfamiliar and uncomfortable to them. It's not a Jewish land. You know, Gentiles live here. And as Jesus leads them into this new territory, they're going to be challenged spiritually, emotionally, relationally, and they're about to be challenged physically. Anytime God expands his kingdom in people's lives, wherever the rule of God is extended in human hearts or in the community, there's going to be a struggle, a storm, a shaking up, of the status quo. Well, the Sea of Galilee was, was notorious for its storms. I mean, they often blew in out of the blue. They were fierce, they were chaotic, they caught people off guard. Even the most prepared fishermen might not be ready for storms like the disciples would face. Except for the fishermen who lived there, most of the people who were Jewish were land lovers. <laughs> they were not seafaring people. They were people of the land. They believed the waters symbolized darkness and the powers of evil that are set against God and his people and against God's plans and purposes. Whether you're used to be on, being on the stormy seas or not, you need to know how to navigate them for hours, maybe days, or even longer, especially when you have wind-tossed waves. The first few months that we lived here, in Illinois, which after last week was, has been 12 years, were some of the stormiest that we had known in a long time before arriving here. You know, thunderstorms are pretty rare in the Pacific Northwest, and tornadoes are almost unheard of. But when we moved to Illinois, our earliest storm experiences landed us in some pretty unusual places. One of the first storms happened shortly after we were here, and we were Zach celebrating my son Zach's graduation from high school. We had just arrived at Applebee's on Dirksen Parkway when there was a tornado siren across the street that went off. We were immediately ushered into the walk-in freezer. We happened to have on shorts that day. We should have been wearing winter coats. A few weeks later, another storm hit while we were at home, and we lost power for several hours. It was very wicked outside and very black inside. We didn't know when we would have electricity again because we were living in a rural area or when the storm would let up. 
So we made a daring decision for us, anyhow. We loaded up our overnight bags and all of our emergency gear, and we came over to the church building. We figure with the fire station right next door, if the pyre power goes out, the church would be one of the first places restored. At least that's how it had been in other places we've lived before. So we spent the night in the youth room, riding out the storm. But by far, our most memorable experience that we had, our, our storm story that we uh, think of first, was when we were on an airplane. You know, you've heard those airplane stories. Well, we have one too. We were returning home from the Detroit area. And uh, the closer we got, the stormier and bumpier the ride got. Since the weather was so severe, our plane was diverted, it was supposed to go to Detroit, to Green Bay, Wisconsin. Now, unless you're a cheesehead, you probably are never going to make it to Green Bay. Well, it was 9 o'clock at night when we landed, and we found hundreds of other people who never expected to end up in northern Wisconsin either. So there we sat for a few hours with a five-year-old boy who was hungry, and we were not sure um, when we get to go back home. Just about midtime, we got the good news. We would be one of the few planes that would be leaving Green Bay that night. As we flew toward Detroit, the turbulence intensified. Like what you see in those airplane movies, you know, the plane was shaking all over the place, you could see lightning flashes outside, and it was deathly quiet in the cabin. People were sitting on pins and needles, almost expecting the worst, wondering if we were going to make the news story for later that night. <clears throat> but as soon as the wheels hit the runway, the whole plane broke out in applause and cheering. Everybody was glad to be safe back on the ground. You know, life is filled with storms, expected and unexpected experiences that shake us up and test our faith. Some of the disciples were seasoned fishermen, but even this storm was too much for them. They know they're at the end of themselves. They know they're past their own know-how and their own strength. More's at stake than they even realize. The stormy waters were symbolic of something deeper that was going on. Because you see, the mission of Jesus is at stake. The people who share this message after he's gone, the lives of the disciples, and their faith is at stake. Those who live in this new territory that they're going over to, their salvation is at stake. There's more going on than meets the eye. Something you need to remember. Things God is doing that we can't yet see. Much is at stake. So how do we navigate these stormy times? Well, let me, let's talk about a couple of things. Some of life's most violent storms are on the path of following God's will. This is perhaps one of the most surprising things about life. We can falsely believe that because we love God and we serve Him, we're going to have the smooth sailing weather the rest of our time here. You know, storms, we think, maybe happen to people who are living outside the will of God, but surely not for those of us who are riding in the same boat with Jesus. With God in our boat, what can go wrong in life? Well, all kinds of unexpected things. Remember, God keeps moving, and he wants to keep us moving. And so that means some unexpected things are going to happen. Some things that trouble us. Many things, most things, where we're going to have to depend on God. Notice what Jesus says in verse 35. He says, let us go over to the other side. Jesus didn't take his disciples out of the storm. He took them right into the storm. Jesus sent the men that he loved on a collision course with the wind and the waves. He knew what, that he was going to get them over to the other side. But you know there's going to be some rough moments out there. There are going to be some big bumps in life. We could be in stormy seas for months. But that doesn't mean God has abandoned us. 
it doesn't necessarily mean that we've gotten off course. The disciples were following God's directions, and look where it got them. One of the most dangerous notions we can believe is that the safest place is to be in God's will. In the palm of his hands, we are safe, right? Nothing can harm us. No water is going to get into our boat. Well, look at this picture. You think any water got into their boat? If it got into their boat, don't you think it's going to get into our boat, even if we're riding with Jesus? What if he sets you right down in front of the storm? Does that mean you're outside of his will? Does that mean you can expect a calm, turbulent, free ride? Well, that doesn't seem to be the story of the Bible. You find men and women who are walking in alignment with God's will, and they walk right in to trouble. Let's take Paul as an example. He was definitely committed to doing what God wanted. But this was his experience that he writes about to the Corinthians. He said, are they servants of Christ? He's, in this case, he's talking about those who are questioning his ministry. And he says, am I out of my mind to talk like this? And then he just describes his experience. He said, I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. I have labored and toiled and often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Now what word does Paul keep repeating? Let's go back to the last side at the very top. Danger! That summarizes Paul's experience with Jesus Christ. Danger. Following Jesus is a dangerous thing to do. It's not for the faint of heart. It's not for people who are only interested in what's safe and comfortable. It's for people who are on their way to the other side and who are committed to doing whatever it takes to get there. Following Jesus is a dangerous thing to do. But do you know what's more dangerous? What's more dangerous is to not be following him. Would you like to be living in this world that currently is overwhelmed with the coronavirus and not following Jesus? That is a very dangerous position to be in. That's because the ship that's headed away from Jesus and his will is going to have a crash landing. Can't be avoided. It's off course. It's not going to make it to the other side. If you're in, in open rebellion against God, you're in a storm of your own creation. And it's not going to have a good ending. The path to heaven's crown passes through a cross. The crucifixion comes before the resurrection. The horrors of Good Friday before the glories of Easter resurrection morning. A stormy path often means that you're walking right down the center of God's will. Don't assume that because you're experiencing some seasickness that you've gotten in the wrong boat. And don't forget, his boat is going to make it over to the other side because Jesus said so. Here's the truth about storms. Storms can drive you to God or drive you away from God, or have you running from Him. Life storms can be scary experiences. They can scare you out of your wits, but don't let them scare you out of your faith. They can either shake your faith or stir your faith to new heights. I'm hoping that in this present crisis that we're facing, it will bring more people to Christ that cause more people to want to sail away 
from Christ. The real issue at the depth of every storm is, what will we do with Jesus? Or maybe a better way of saying it is, what will we let Jesus do with us? Running away is not a good idea. Just ask Jonah. It got him into a whale of trouble that he could have avoided. And here are the disciples. They're shaken in their faith. When the squall comes up and the heavens are, and the waves are breaking over the boat, they run to Jesus. But they were driven by the wrong thing. They're driven by fear. Jesus asked them, why are you so afraid? Why do you still have no faith? Sometimes our routines need to be shaken up, and they're being shaken up this, these days, so that what is unshakable, so what's unchangeable and eternal, that's where we're living our lives. God can use the COVID-19 crisis to get our hearts, our priorities, and our purpose in life back in the right place. Here's how Hebrews puts it. One last shaking from top to bottom, stem to stern. The phrase, one last shaking, means a thorough house cleaning. Getting rid of all the historical and religious junk so that the unshakable essentials stand clear and uncluttered. Do you see what we've got as believers? An unshakable kingdom. And do you see how thankful we must be? Not only thankful, but brimming over with worship, deeply reverent before God. For God is not an indifferent bystander. You know, God's just not standing there and saying, okay, let's see what, how people deal with this. He's actively cleaning house, torching all that needs to burn, and he won't quit until it's all cleansed. God himself is a fire. And so lack of faith and unbelief often keeps us from experiencing the miracles that God wants to do in our lives. Later on, Mark tells us that when Jesus was in his hometown, he could not do any miracles there. And why? He was amazed at their lack of faith. The people of Nazareth didn't get to see the amazing and mysterious work of God that he was ready to do because they were unwilling to believe in him. Storms reveal the depth of your faith in God. Do storms have you running away in fear or running to him in faith? The real catastrophe, you see, is not the storm. It's what's going on in your heart. Jesus said, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Now, the word for change means to turn around or to head in the opposite direction. It has the same root as the word that we use for catastrophe, which means a turning around. A catastrophe is an upheaval. Storms remind us that we are a child and that we have a loving father. There are a lot of things that we can't control in life as children. A childlike faith has us turning away from our old patterns of handling life on our own to the one who's really in charge. The message versions of what Jesus said is, I'm telling you once and for all that unless you return to square one and start over like children, you're not even going to get a look at the kingdom of God, let alone get it. Unless you're willing to have a change of heart and direction, you can't get in on what God wants to do in your life. Storms are occasions for turning our hearts His direction. So where is it that you turn? Abraham Lincoln is reported to have said, I have been driven to my knees many times by the overwhelming conviction that I had nowhere else to go. I would modify Lincoln's words to say, when you find yourself in a stormy time, let it drive you to your knees with the overwhelming conviction that Jesus Christ is the first place you need to go. And then there's this about storms. Storms often teach you something new about God. There's fear in the storm. You know, fear is a natural reaction to things that seem bigger and out of our hands. 
It seems Jesus is sleeping here. People are throwing up over the side. They're, they're fighting. They're screaming at each other. They're panicking. They're trying to find a way through this. And Jesus, well, he doesn't seem to have a care in the world. And sometimes we think he doesn't care about us. Some of the most vulnerable times in our lives are not just when God seems to be absent, but when it appears like he's not doing anything to change our situation. And so we, we feel helpless, powerless, vulnerable, even ignored. When President Ronald Lincoln died about 16 years ago, people evaluated his character and his leadership and his legacy and all those things that we do after somebody famous passes away. You know, Reagan was a very charismatic and charming person in public, but he was very mysterious in private. Even his own daughter, Patty Davis, said that he was endearing, but puzzling. She said he left us with the same question. This is from his family. Who was he? Well, the disciples are trying to figure this out about Jesus. Who is he? When the storm comes up, they run to Jesus and they shake him awake. And notice what they say. They say, teacher, don't you care if we drown? You see, your ideas about who Jesus is, about who God is, will either be a help or a hindrance to you when you face the storms of life. If you put God in any kind of box with limitations on him and what he can do, you're going to feel overwhelmed by the storm. The storm's going to seem bigger than he is. The disciples thought Jesus had gone to sleep on them. He didn't seem to care about what they were going through. Sometimes it can seem like that. After C.S. Lewis lost his wife, Joy, to cancer, it just didn't seem to him like God cared. This is what he said, when your situation is desperate, here's what you find. Lewis said, it's like a door slammed in your face and the sound of bolting and double bolting from the inside. And after that, silence. He said, you might as well turn away. The longer you wait, the more emphatic the silence becomes. What does it mean? Why is he such a present commander in a time of prosperity and so very absent a help in time of need? If you haven't struggled with that question, you will. Where is God when life seems to be falling apart? Where is he in the panicky pandemic? The answer hasn't changed. He's still in your boat if you've allowed him into your life. His still voice is not about whether he cares or not. It's about the kind of God you believe in and trust in. That's going to depend on whether you think he can change your situation or maybe change you or not. Silence begs the question, what kind of God are you really serving? Do you know who he is? The problem isn't that Jesus has gone to sleep on us. The issue is we need a grown-up understanding of who he is. Jesus is not there just to make us feel good and make everything right in our world. Jesus is there to show you what a mighty God he is in spite of the circumstances of your life. And so we're told Jesus got up, rebuked the wind and the waves. He said, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and was completely calm. And the disciples asked themselves, who is this? You know, even the wind and the waves obey him. Jesus turned to the most powerful force of nature known at that time. And he said, sit down and shut up. At that time, the disciples got a new view of who Jesus was. He was so much more than they thought he was. Your storms will teach you some new things about God if you let them. You'll learn this God controls the wind and the waves. He's so much more than you ever believed he was before. Your storms will also teach you something about yourself, where your faith in God and dependence on him needs to be greater. But remember this, no earthly storm can thwart God's heavenly plans. Do you believe that? 
Do you believe that God is far bigger and greater than anything that could possibly happen to you? If you're in God's boat and he says, let's go over to the other side, it's a guarantee that no matter what happens out there in the open sea of life, you're going to get to where God wants to take you. The one who called you, Paul says, is completely dependable. If he said it, he will do it. You can count on God, even when you can't begin to figure out the circumstances of your life. A Jewish rabbi in a small Russian village spent years just sort of pondering the mysteries of the universe. And finally he concluded that when it got down to the root of things, you just didn't really know. And after he reached this conclusion, I mean, he was constantly talking about this, you just really never know. Well, he was walking across the town square one day when a Cossack, a town policeman, accosted him. The Cossack was in a bad mood, and he arrested the rabbi. Hey, rabbi, where are you going? The rabbi said, as he was accustomed to saying all the time, I don't know. This infuriated the Cossack. What do you mean you don't know? For the last 20 years, you've been coming across the square at the same time of the day on your way to pray at the synagogue. That's where you're headed right now. I'm going to teach you not to make a fool of me as he carted him off to jail. So he grabbed him and dragged him off. But just as he was about to put him in jail, he said to the Cossack, the rabbi said, You see, you just never know where you're going to end up. You may not know where you're going, or even where the world seems to be going right now, but God does. The disciples certainly could not see where things were going when Jesus was arrested and crucified. You may not understand the reason for where you are right now in life, but God doesn't always give explanations. He very rarely does. He gives you himself, and that's what you need most at this time. God acts one step at a time, and he invites you to trust him one day at a time. By the way, if you are in Jesus' boat, if you're one of his disciples, you know exactly where you're going. Jesus said before the storm, we're going over to the other side. God's going to get you to where he wants to ultimately take you, which is ultimately heaven if you'll agree to go along for the ride. Joe Saxton says, when I was 18, somebody said to me, God's hold on you is stronger than your hold on him, and he has no intention of letting you go. Can you believe him yet? Can you believe that he's bigger than your biggest storm? That he who is in us is greater than anything that we face in this world? That he's larger than our deepest fear, stronger than our greatest enemy, because he is God. It's been said, don't doubt in the dark what you've heard in the light. What did you hear see, say, uh, God say before you got into the lake, before you faced the wind and the waves? That's why it's so important for us to know what God says, his word, before we hit a headwind. What did God say to you before you ran into your storm? What has he promised? Don't doubt God when things get dark. Remember what he said in the light. He cares about you and your storms. Finally, the best place to be in a storm is with Jesus. H. Norman Wright said, our world is unstable. It rocks our boat. Right now, it's rocking our lives. We are unstable. We rock our boat. But our stability comes from allowing Jesus Christ to be our rock. He will be the sure foundation for your times. When you build your life on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, you'll be standing when the storm is over. You see, there's no better place to be in life's storms than with Jesus. The right place to be, no matter what comes your way, it's with Jesus. It's only with Him that life can possibly 
be better than you can imagine even after the storm has passed. Sometimes it looks like he's asleep, but you know that's a human perspective. It looks, if it looks like he's asleep, that's because he knows who's in control. When it appears like he's asleep, it's because he has an inner peace that's far greater than any outward storm. Jesus was filled with peace and calm, even while there were troubled waters all around him. How unlike us, we toss and turn at night like a boat on a stormy sea. And in the morning, we're exhausted and in a state of panic. That's because we've forgotten who's in our boat and who has a handle on things. We spend our time searching for our own ideas about how to get out of our problems rather than seeking Christ and trusting in his promises. In verse 41 of the passage we read at the beginning, the disciples are terrified, but it's a different kind of fear. Before it was a desperate fear, but in the Greek it, it means they're filled with a reverent awe. Who is this? You know, who is this? Even the wind and waves obey him. Who is this Jesus? Before, they called him teacher. In their storm, they get a fresh revelation of the goodness and greatness of God, that he's with you in the storm, that he rebukes the wind and the waves. He rescues our lives in the stormy sea. Their fear of the storm pales in comparison to now their faith and awe of who this Jesus is. He's more than a miracle worker. He's God. In the midst of today's storm, maybe you need to come to him like the man who said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And here's the best part of the story. As wild as the storm is, it doesn't bother Jesus, but it catch, what catches attention is not the storm. It's the cry of his disciples. No matter how furious and loud the storm gets, he hears your cry. He hears your heart. And it's the most beautiful sound in his ears. Quiet, be still. He's going to tell the coronavirus and all the turmoil that it is creating to sit down and shut up. He's not forgotten you. He's with you. He hears your heart. And you know, I can see it coming. Land ho! No matter what happens, we're going to make it to the other side. Join me in reading and praying together the serenity prayer. This is the prayer we need to keep in mind as we face our stormy seas. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, Accepting hardship as a pathway to peace. Taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is. Not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will. So that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen.